Welcome to the educators panel of this global uh, digital challenge 2020. Uh, my name is Ishan Ajwad. I'm a senior economist at the World Bank here in Washington, DC. I have a distinguished panel here with me. Um, and uh, we're here to talk about uh, some of the challenges affecting the education uh, today um, in, this, in this world that we're in with uh, COVID-19, uh, but also to talk about innovative solutions to meet those challenges. So really the, the second part is the, is the meat of today's discussion. Uh, I want to thank the Convergence Tech team uh, and the organizing committee of the Global Digital Challenge uh, for organizing this because really it's going to be, uh, I think, a really interesting uh, discussion going forward and, and I'm looking forward to the challenge as well. Before I start, I just, uh, I, I just want to give you one striking uh, number. Uh, about half of 10-year-olds in low and middle income countries cannot read an age appropriate sentence. Now the World Bank has called that a learning crisis. This happened before COVID-19, before schools closed. So in other words, we are now in a deeper crisis, in a deeper learning crisis than we were in. And even then things were really bad. Um, I think we have ample reason to worry. From a, from a COVID point of view, we are now in October and almost 40 million people have been affected by the virus. Uh, about a million people, maybe more than a million people have died from uh, cor uh, the coronavirus. So it's a very serious crisis that has led to a shutdown of many economies around the world. And when we talk about the recovery, um, there are many people who started talking about a V-shaped recovery. We are now eight to 10 months since the beginning of this uh, crisis. And obviously there has been no recovery. Um, what we're worried about from an education point of view is that the recovery will not be V-shaped, but that it might be K-shaped, meaning that some of the people who had the resources, had the uh, assets will do well, who will do even better than they did before. And some of the people who don't have the tutoring, the Wi-Fi, will actually fall behind and fall back. And that's what we're worried about, that K-shape, that, that widening of the inequality gap. That's, I think, what we're really concerned about here. That, that can come about because of uh, the digital divide. It can come about because of the inequalities in the world that we see uh, already. So... Um, we have a very distinguished panel here. I'm not going to introduce all of them right now. I'm going to introduce them as we go through some of the questions. Um, but let's go right to the questions because we have a lot of knowledge uh, in the panel here to, uh, to, to draw from. So the first question, uh, and I'm going to ask this question of Mark Hansen, who is a superintendent at... Um, at a district in uh, an award-winning district in Wisconsin. He's going through some uh, difficult uh, COVID-related issues in, uh, in uh, the state, but, but it'll be interesting to get his perspective. And it'll be also good to get the perspective of Madi Rahman um, uh, and to hear about her, her work from the Malala uh, Fund Champion uh, 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 girls Fund, uh, because what we're interested in here is to understand what some of the key challenges are to learning today. Uh, with schools closed or partially closed, uh, what have students and educators faced? Uh, in terms of school dropouts, uh, we're concerned right now, just, just yesterday, the World Bank president said that almost a billion students are out of school. These are massive numbers. What do you think will happen to those children? How many of them will come back to school? How will inequalities be affected? And how will quality of schooling be affected? So let me start with you, Mark, and then we'll go to Madia. <clears throat> Over to you, Mark. 
Good morning. Thank you. Um, I think the the words change and new come to mind when I think about what educators are going to face. Um, everything is new right now, uh, from microphones to cameras in the classroom to kids on screens to Zoom to Google Meets. Everything's new, and change management has um, certainly overwhelmed the educational system. Uh, from a student or a learner perspective, I think the sense of belonging and relationships, learning is a social experience by and large, and having a relationship on a screen is very different than in a classroom. And so I worry about the isolation and uh, the sense of belonging not being as prevalent as it would be in face-to-face. -face. Uh, th th this is the biggest challenge I've ever faced in my 30-year career is trying to make a continuity of learning a reality when we're in and out of school all the time right now. Madiha, would you like to give us your perspective, possibly from a South Asia perspective, but even, even larger if you'd like to, on, on what you think the key challenges are for students and their learning? <laughs> So, um, you know, Pakistan is a developing country. We all are familiar with that. And um, so, and it has an unequal access to internet here. Um, and the reason why, you know, most of the population does not have access to the internet is uh, because of, you know, infrastructural gaps, um, the economic inequality, and the rural-urban divide is also a major player um, that, you know, causes, uh, that leaves our youth our children not having access to internet. So 65% of our population lives in rural areas, and only 35% of total population of the country has access to high-speed internet, which means that 65% of our population uh, do not have access to internet. There are regions where you know, there is no connectivity at all. So when this COVID happened, and uh, before I even comment on this, 22.6 million children are out of school in Pakistan. So even before COVID hit Pakistan, a lot of student, children or youth were not attending schools. They were uh, you know, either dropouts or have never been to school before. Uh, with pandemic coming to Pakistan, uh, the situation is going to get worse only. So while we are worrying about enrollment losses, we are also worried about learning losses. Because even those children who are in school, they do not have access to internet and they do not have you know, any sort of connection to the learning process right now. Uh, the federal government of Pakistan tried to you know, step up the game and you know, they tried to be very proactive about it. Uh, they introduced a teleschool in collaboration with the state television, and they took private sector on board. Uh, so the private sector, which is mainly uh, the, I'm talking about the ed tech private sector, uh, who have been for the past one decade uh, in the process of developing educational technology solutions uh, based on blended learning or otherwise for students who do not have access to uh, schools. But the challenge of making that content accessible to kids is still there. So government is now looking at uh, this challenge. Uh, I'm trying to you know, take the private sector on board. They, you know, we have been having some roundtable discussions and conferences where we are brainstorming ideas that how uh, you know, at uh, an emergency level, we can you know, kind of do an overhaul of the system. Because, um, so we did open schools uh, on the 15th of September, but then right after the schools were open, second wave of COVID hit Pakistan again. And uh, so even if the schools are open, parents are very reluctant to send their kids to school. Uh, so that issue of learning losses is still there. And we're also noticing that, you know, if in a school there were um, 100 students registered in a certain grade, only 30 to 40 percent of them are attending school. So most of them are staying back either because you know they are afraid to come back to the you know schools or they cannot afford to come back to school because of the economic constraints you know or the consequences this pandemic has left for many people. 
Uh, so with the help of Malala Fund and other donor agencies, uh, you know, my organization is also working on some educational solutions that can help children who do not have access to internet in staying connected with the learning process. So we are producing some audio programs uh, which are being aired on radio channels. Then we are also you know, in conversation with the state television, which is running the teleschool program uh, to make whatever, to make our content available to children who have access to uh, radio and television. They may not have access to the smartphones and internet, but you know, at community level or school level, if they have access to uh, radio or TV, so through these mediums, we are trying to uh, you know, kind of continue their learning process. Uh, but then again, um, as I mentioned before, that, you know, 65% of our population lives in rural areas and they do not have, some areas even do not have electricity. So those kids who were going to school before um, or non-formal education centers, they have kind of, you know, completely lost the connection with the learning process. Uh, so while we are suggesting, well, you know, uh, looking at solutions and devising policies and strategies, uh, we are looking at the crisis at two levels. One is at enrollment level and the other one is at, you know, the learning process level. Rahim Espahai, <laughs> I know he's <laughs> busy with his daughter right now. But uh, Rahim, if you can talk, um, I know you... Uh, uh, you teach uh, business and uh, cooperative education at the John Polney uh, Collegiate uh, Institute in Toronto. But, but I know that you are interested in some of the links between, uh, between schooling and community. So, but we associate schools with learning, but, th the, but there are things that come with schooling. Uh, there, there are clubs. Uh, there are sports, there are links to the community, uh, and in some cases, food. Um, uh, I, I know, for example, in, uh, in many parts of the world, um, about 300 million children depend on schools for their main meal, their main meal. Um, and then I'd like you to talk about what you think of... Um, going back to what Mark said about the sense of belonging, but also how you can link, uh, link uh, or where we think you're missing out on the links between um, uh, children and the community uh, in, in this world that we're in. Go ahead. Hello, everyone. I guess we have a, a, another visitor to our call right now. Uh, <laughs> um, but once again, thank you for this forum. And I'm happy to share some of the amazing work that's, that's happening in our community. <clears throat> I want you to picture the most beautiful and organic classroom that you've ever seen in the world. Uh, and that is the 1.3 acre urban farm that I have on my school property and that we brought in with a non-for-profit organization. Um, I also want you to understand that my school is located in the second lowest income postal code in all of Toronto. Uh, it is a highly newcomer, uh, um, I guess, population. We have populations uh, and households of six, seven, eight children. And there's been some instances where I've taught all eight children uh, in the community, which is quite interesting. However, the need is there for um, not only mentorship, uh, support, and connection, but obviously to um, harvest an organic food, which is totally connected to how one learns. We've been blessed on a yearly basis to harvest over <clears throat> 16,000 pounds of organic fruits and vegetables that are then given out to our community members, our families, and ultimately uh, our students. When COVID hit, it was a very difficult time as a number of our families, our community members relied on their weekly produce that they would get from our, our organic farm through the non-for-profit organization in which individuals would not have to pay for. What was great about this organization called the Pact Urban Peace Program is that we quickly changed um, our dynamics. We um, applied for a federal grant and ultimately became an emergency food program for the community, which was a, a massive blessing as well. We also received a $20,000 grant uh, from the Loblaws Corporation. And since the end of April, 
we have been providing over, I'm looking at my stats here, over 140 households, uh, equaling over to 400 individuals on a weekly basis, fruits, vegetables, and a cooked meal in which they and their families can have, uh, which has been a, an amazing, amazing, amazing blessing uh, and a lifeline to, to, our, to our families and our students in need. What's ultimately... Uh, um, beautiful about this partnership is that we have volunteers that are now able to come in and help out. I had my students out there. Uh, we also made a small little classroom at the back of the garden. So if individuals don't get, uh, so, so our students don't get so cooped up inside a classroom, their access, they have some access to some outdoor space as well, which we all know that's so very important. So this partnership, this 1.3 acre farm is more than just a farm. It is more than just a garden. It is a more than just a place for people can do a science experiment and do some volunteering. It has become a hub of the community, which ultimately has also been able to provide sustenance for our most underserved population in Toronto. And I know that's sometimes hard to find and, and hard to swallow the sense that Toronto, Canada, we have these uh, communities that have been completely underserved. But these are the individuals that I teach. These are the families that I've been working with for the last 15 years, and the need isn't stopping. And as a result, this has been a bright light for our students, for our families to, you know, to continue to be able to, to meet all the needs of the household. It's outside of the garden, you know, outside of our farm. It has been very difficult for our students uh, as we don't have the basketball teams, we don't have the soccer teams, we, we don't have all those extracurriculars with the arts, which has been the main, one of the main reasons sometimes why our kids come to school. Um, but when we have conferences and competitions like the digital inclusion competition, when I can take them outside for a walk, and when us teachers and the students can come together some way, shape, or form, we're trying to find ways to ensure, yes, baby, to ensure that our individuals feel connected. And that is the essence of school. Ultimately, that is the essence of school, especially for our kids. Until they trust you, until they trust the process, until they trust the system, you will never, ever get to see who they actually are. And these have been one of the amazing experiential learning opportunities and partnerships that I've been able to bring to our community. Sorry, I went over everybody. Wonderful. Um, so let's let's then. Uh, I think I think we've we've gone through some of the key challenges, and I think it's important for us to think about what would be needed here in terms of solutions. Mark talked about the need for change, uh, and Madi had talked about some of the problems in terms of even digital access. Um, if, you, if, you look at, if you look at the literature out there, I think many people agree that what is needed is a multi-platform type solution, one that includes computers, it includes TVs, it includes radios, it includes mobile phones. It basically tries to do as uh, bring in all these platforms so that you can reach as many people as possible uh, and try and impart this learning. Uh, I'd like to hear from you about some of the interesting and bold technology solutions you've seen uh, during, this, uh, during this pandemic and lockdown. Um, Maybe we can start with, uh, I guess you go by Baz, uh, Baldish uh, Nija. Uh, he's the head of the uh, Center of Excellence uh, for Digital Industries, uh, GEMS First Point School in UAE. UAE, I associate with one of the most digitally um, connected and advanced uh, nations. So that'll be interesting to hear from you, uh, Baz. But uh, I'd also like to hear from the Australian perspective, from Darian Ros Rosetier, uh, who's a principal advisor to the, uh, the deputy vice chancellor education and vice president uh, of RMIT University in Melbourne, Australia. And then we'll go back to Mark Hansen uh, from Wisconsin. I'm going to take a little bit of a, of a perspective more from some of the older students. Um, from within, shall I say, tertiary um, education. Um, and I'm going to really probably use the term lifelong learner. So that really does capture, I think, learners from all ages. But I think that's very relevant because what 
one of the challenges that we have at the moment is that we are all facing some very serious changes and differences to the way that we have been learning and what our lifestyle and what our aspirations and ambitions have been. And I think this particular topic, which is talking about, if you like, the technologies or how we might use technologies to leverage and to help us address some of these challenges is a really interesting one at the moment. Um, I agree that what we have been doing at, within my institution, and I can see across the sector in my part of the world in Australia, is that there is a challenging on the one hand of these sort of monolithic platforms about putting all of the learning into one basket and allowing a greater diversity. And I think that has become important for us as well. As we sort of look to the fact that um, the, uh, the virtual learning environments or the learning management systems or whichever part of the world that you come from um, are not going to be the solution for everything that we need to achieve and that we're wanting to achieve in, as far as our learning and our teaching is concerned. If I have one big message and one that is really resonating for a lot of our learners in, the lock, in this lockdown period, it's the importance of staying connected. And I think Mark and others have touched on this as well. It's this sense of belonging, this human need to be part of a group. So moving away with, away from just the, con the concept of content and assessing people and trying to structure learning very formally, we've looked at some apps and, and technologies that can, you know, really reach out and speak to that issue of belonging and feeling that you're part of something. And that's particularly important for some of our non-traditional learners um, who were coming into learning or back to learning for, you know, the first time for a long way, for a long time. They may be a little older and they may, in fact, already be in the workforce. Um, but for them, you know, this is a really, really important part of their life. And they are so enthusiastic that they want to stay connected. So one sort of technology here, you know, and it's not the only, of course, but, you know, we are, we're starting to use Slack. Um, and we're starting to have this for the informal conversations that take place between mentors from industry and our teachers and some of our students. And although it's not the platform to, to really, um, I would say, support in a structured way what we're doing with students because you don't have the threads and you don't have the history, it's something that is a, a tool of the workforce and, and of industry and something that means, um, I think it, it's a relevant tool that people may be able to, to um, apply, not just now in their formal learning, but much later in the workforce as well. So for us, this is really um, being very beneficial. We find the students are really comfortable working, working with Slack or WhatsApp or something like this. Um, and they're using it for that sense of social conversation that you might have had, you know, when you're out of the formal class or elsewhere. And we, instead of feeling conflicted by this or a little bit concerned by it, although we know it's got limits, some limitations, um, we're really trying to embrace it. Another example for us, um, and also this is really trying to address some of the challenges of not being face to face with people is, is the project work that we're doing. And for a lot of our students, we're trying to introduce um, agile ways of working and, and methodologies. And of course, that's often involved being together and being able to um, work through, put post-it notes up and talk through how you can work with sort of physical objects and, and address all sorts of interesting challenges there. Um, again, we've looked out to what are some other tools, not so much sitting within the, the, bigger, the bigger platforms that we know, but what are some of the other tools? So we've used, um, you know, digital post-it note tools such as Miro, where you can annotate and post on digital boards in real time and discuss and move and move things around. So that's another one that we've just used to complement what we've been doing within the more formal coursework and those sorts of, of um, more conventional ways that, you know, you've put um, learning online. And the final one that I'll mention um, is coming to um, 
how we're using um, video and video a little bit, again, to have that human element um, at the end to cap off a, of a course so that we ask students to actually reflect on what they've been doing, what's been challenging for them about their learning, what it is that they've done in um, part of the formal assessments, but to actually do, as it were, a video testimonial. Again, we think this is a really important tool, not just for um, what we might say is um, employment and learning, but actually for life as well. So in that, and, and of course, so many of our students are using all sorts of video all the time. We're using Zoom now, but you know, this is a, this is a tool or a technology that they are familiar with, but how do we get them to use it in a way that's a little different? So not only is it kind of um, stepping in and it's assuring us that we are actually getting some assessment or we're getting some meaningful reflection in terms of what, what the learning has been for that past um, term or semester, or I guess in many cases now we're, we're well into our second semester of learning this way. But it's, it's showing, giving our students the opportunity to be enthusiastic and motivated and passionate and actually speak to um, the thoughtful reflection pieces about what it is they're doing here and what's important and meaningful for them. So that, that, you know, those sort of tools like Vix Verify and so on, they allow us to do this sort of video capstone, if you like, um, which brings that, that human connection and that human piece um, into some of the learning that has felt so distant or isolating for so many. Thank you very much, uh, Darian. That, it was nice to hear about some of the specific tools that have helped uh, to to keep students connected and engaged uh, in the work. This is, this is key. Uh, Mark, if we can go back to you to hear about some of the things that maybe you're using in the American context, in the Wisconsin context, or maybe even in your district uh, that, that are interesting um, to, to, try, to try and keep education going and uh, to keep students engaged. Sure. As we all look to combat the COVID slide, whether it be from an economic perspective or an education perspective, I think there are a handful of solutions that come to mind from device deployment to broadband access to teacher training and all of the things in between. When I think of some of the things that we've had success with in our school district, um, I, I think of a, a couple of things. First of all, as Darian referenced, uh, video has played a pivotal role in everything we've done. And so we've tried to build the mindset that we're turning every classroom into a video conferencing center. And so how do you simulcast your classrooms so learners who can't be at school for whatever reason, assuming good intentions, judgment free, uh, but they can't be in school, how are we getting them access to learning? Um, the, the other thing, when you talk about the, the more mature learner, the later learner, the high school age in, in the States, we're talking 14 to 18 year old, all the way into post secondary, um, we have some software challenges because many of the learning devices that they work on are going to require some personal computing platform needs. So how do you turn every device into a virtual desktop? Uh, so when you talk about Adobe or some other high-end softwares, how are you getting kids access to a virtual desktop through a device that may not have a PC computing capability? Uh, so we've deployed virtual desktops to help us with computer science, digital imaging, and other things. So they, they can come in on a Chromebook. They can come in on an iPad uh, and still have access to that high-end software. And then... Uh, the, the other thing that, that maybe not technology based, but to some degree it is uh, in the States, we have school districts and they're defined by geographic boundaries. Uh, and inside each of those districts are innovative practices and innovative programs. What has happened in the COVID era is we've watched some of those boundaries get flattened. And so in, in our school district, we have kids accessing some innovative programming 
uh, from three other neighboring school districts because we've built a digital platform for them to access that. So they don't have to get into a car or get on mass transportation to get there. But because we've turned our classrooms into virtual conference centers, they're able to access it from their own location as opposed to coming to our location. So those are three bold things that come to mind when I think about uh, what we can do to combat COVID slide. Maybe we can go to um, Alim Lada, uh, who is a founder of the Instill Education. They do a lot of work in Africa. I think they're based in Joburg. Um, but uh, but to talk a little bit about the African context, and then we can have um, Juliana. Uh, I'm I'm sorry. I'm going to try and say your last name, Rafagalini. <laughs> sorry, uh, she's a researcher at the U Universitat Oberta de uh, Catalonia in Spain. Um, and then uh, hopefully Rahim is still on. I know he is on his way to school, but uh, we'd like to get his uh, thinking as well on, on a key topic, which is given the challenges that we've seen, and we've heard a number of you mention the challenges, um, we, we've also seen these new teaching methods take hold. And, and Mark mentioned a few, Darian mentioned a few, and, uh, and Baz uh, talked about a few of these. Um, the question really is, how do we make sure that parents, teachers, school leaders uh, adjust to these challenges? They're, they're all, they all play such an important role. How do we adjust? How do they adjust to this, uh, to these new teaching methods? And how do we give them the tools to adjust to this? So maybe we can start with you, Alim, and then uh, we'll go down. The, the Thanks, Mohamed. Um <laughs> Look, I, I, uh, there's a meme that come to mind to me when I, when I talk about the challenges we're facing right now. It popped in my WhatsApp a few days ago about what drove the digital solutions of your organization. Was it the CEO? Was it the CTO? Or was it COVID? And obviously the right answer was COVID because obviously we've had to reimagine what's possible in the current context. And I think that at least sitting here in Johannesburg, um, Africa is a large continent, so I'm not going to pretend to speak for the continent, but speaking to at least what is in my immediate uh, network of understanding is we've been forced to actually maybe reframe the question, right? So the answer isn't how do we do what we do today um, using technology and et cetera. The, the question is actually are we still, uh, do we still do what we're doing today, right? Is, is education and learning the way it's been done today um, the way to go. And now, all of you, I'm sure, have been a part of these conversations for the last 20 years. We have, you know, the really interesting conversation with Ken Robinson that talks about the the legacy we're carrying from the the, the British uh, the, the British uh, colonization uh, impact, at least on the African continent. But the reality of it is, until COVID happened, we haven't been forced to ask that question and say, "Well, what do we do now?" Right. And just to highlight a few of the challenges, I, I think all of you have touched upon them, but just maybe bring the African dimension to this, is we talk about how we do support teachers to be able to deliver today's methods in a COVID world when, you know, on the African continent, we, I think, according to UNESCO, are going to have a 7 to 15 million teacher shortage on the continent, right? So we can have all this conversation about what can teachers do more and how do we professional develop them in developing flexible learning, but we have a, forget the quality conversation, we have a supply problem that is just looming on the continent, right? We don't have a very attractive teaching, uh, teaching profession on the continent, right? So we have uh, the average life of a teacher on the continent between five and seven years in the profession, and then they move on to something else. So you're operating in this context. Uh, what's the role of the parents? Well, the role of parents is, is, is an interesting question on the continent, because you look at countries like South Africa, who've had a an HIV pandemic and a tuberculosis pandemic where a lot of the learners we work with don't have parents. They are the parents of their household, right? And so, great, let's have a conversation about the roles of parents, but you have 25 to 30% of the population that are in the age of 12 to 18 that are the caretakers for their families, right? So it is forcing us to think about innovative solutions uh, that we've been talking about for the last 10 years, right? So a couple of ideas here, and as you can see, I can talk about this for hours, and I'm not going to do that to any of you guys, is COVID has asked, has forced some of the schools we work with to reimagine what is important in learning, right? So 
Uh, we have a lot of conversation, at least in South Africa, about the fourth industrial revolution and 21st century skills and all that. And you have the World Bank that, you know, you pointed that earlier, you know, age 10, not able to read. What are we talking about doing computer skills when people can barely read and write, right? And so some schools have actually made an, a, a conscious effort to say, listen, let's actually use this time to get literacy and numeracy right and deprioritize other things, right? So that's one thought. The second thought that you see happening a lot more on the continent is to start thinking about, well, if the school is not the only place where learning happens, how do we get intentional about that design? So I love Raheem's example of some of the work he's done in, 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 in Toronto. Um, next time I'm in Canada, I'd love to come and see it. Um, I'm a Montrealer, so Toronto is going to be a stretch, but I'll be there. Um, but the, the thought we're, we're helping teachers to think through is to say, well, if learning is going to happen not only in your classroom, but also at home and also in your community, and some of them have jobs, right? How do you actually pull a thread together? So as a teacher training institute, we're, we're a new teacher training university. Um, I'm in the midst of a regulatory conversation right now to allow us to launch in January. The conversation we're having is how do you help teachers not become content expert, but actually um, problem solver around building threads so that they don't have to have all the answers, but are able to create the journey that a lot of students can start at school, continue on WhatsApp and deliver elsewhere. And the last thing is, it's more of a challenge um, that I'm gonna put out there is, the answer, I think, at least on the continent, is not multi-platform. It's actually multi-channel, right? It's the same content delivered through different modalities that but still come together in one place, right? So uh, I'll take an example of a really inspiring uh, network of schools in South Africa. I would encourage all of you to just look it up. It's called Spark Schools. They work with um, the lower middle class, and they're trying to deliver quality education at the price the government does it. So that's their the price point and their cost point, they use a mixture of WhatsApp, print, um, TV, but in a coherent way. So it, it is not multi, multi-platform in the sense that you can, there's many platforms you're using to kind of stitch something together, it, but it's more multi-channel in the sense that the same content is delivered to just match the access needs and also the, the context where people are going. I can keep going about some of the innovations on the continent, but I think that the key message for us has been it's forced us to reimagine the role of educators, what we are teaching, the role of schools, and how do we actually thread these journeys together. Juliana, can you please talk to us a little bit about, um, about maybe the European perspective and, and maybe even the Latin American perspective? In July, only in July, the EU responds to the COVID outbreaks in, in a, a, a huge uh, funding for national policies, uh, green and digital policies, and the Digital Education Action Plan that was uh, very uh, recently launched. Uh, and, and this, is, this uh, Digital Education Action Plan is based in, in two areas of intervention, fostering the development of high-performing digital education ecosystem in terms of infrastructures, and uh, of course, uh, digital skills and competencies. And um, I may say, for example, Spain and Italy taking advantage of uh, that fundings uh, augmented uh, their uh, fundings to the schooling system in around 20% of the prior uh, situation in 2019. And they used those funds mostly to hiring teachers, more teachers, and this is very good because we will have uh, very uh, younger teachers entering into, into a system that is really aging. As we, you must, you must uh, understand that in Italy, 50% uh, of the teachers, uh, um, sorry, uh, um, more than 50% of the teachers uh, are uh, aged more than 55 years old. So this uh, is a challenge for the using of technologies. Uh, there was a lot of insistence, both for the university sector and the schooling system, mostly in Italy than in Spain, for example. You see the cultural differences in two countries that are near culturally. Uh, insisting, insistence in coming back physically to school and in the um, uh, failure of digital education, just because digital education was not properly implemented, because more, um, there were uh, 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 skills shortage uh, in spite of uh, at least three cycles of 
uh, national policies to implement a digital school, both in Spain from uh, I, and the 90s uh, until now. So we are about the, the third uh, cycle. So uh, an, one important uh, lection and, um, and one important uh, learning uh, we had relating this situation was the importance of providing infrastructures, devices uh, to the families, but also uh, promoting adults education to uh, um, strengthening the policies of adults education. Why? Because uh, when adults education is improved, uh, the families uh, are um, empowered, there, there are more capacity to support the children in an ecosystem, in a sort of learning ecosystem, lifelong learning ecosystem, where uh, the adults uh, learn uh, together with the children because there were very, I did a number of interviews uh, within schools and with uh, the families, and they were really happy to be able, in, in spite of the stressful condition and in spite of the stress mostly for women, worker women, they were really happy to learn together with the children, to gain new uh, spaces for learning, uh, particularly around technologies. But they, they felt mostly enough, uh, not able of working with a certain uh, activities that were uh, sent by uh, the teachers. So mm -hmm. it was very important to improve dialogue uh, between the school and the parents and to create a learning ecosystem supporting adults' education, adults' learning, and this will uh, continue through policies for adults' education because adults' ed education, because as, as I, Alim said, uh, the, uh, the children's not only learn at school, they learn in a, in a sort of uh, a continuum, uh, in a seamless uh, uh, situation of learning, mostly when using technologies, and they need the support by the families, and the families need to learn about learning in, okay. in the light of learning society. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julian. It was very interesting to hear that perspective. We often forget the fact that uh, even in resource-rich countries where you believe everybody has computers and Wi-Fi and so on, you think that there are no challenges, but in fact, the challenges are very significant. Uh, so it was very interesting to hear that perspective from you. Thank you for that. Uh, Rahim, I know you're driving. I hope you're safe. Uh, but if you are, uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts on how uh, you've seen some of these teaching methods that have been applied during this time of COVID and the lockdown and so on, but how uh, we can help parents, teachers, school leaders, and so on try and uh, deal, with, uh, deal with this um, situation and, uh, and help learning. Go ahead, Rahim. Thanks for the heads up of when we were going to chat. I was able to stop off before I got onto the highway. Um, I'd like to preface my, my answer by saying one statement, and, and that is, you know, there are so many people that are outside of education that are consistently telling me and telling teachers what should be done, what should uh, success look like um, when they haven't stepped into a class or my class ever. Um, and as a result, we keep on getting the what. However, we haven't got the how. Uh, we, and we only get the how from very certain, very few individuals and organizations. I've been blessed to be a part of uh, one major organization uh, over the last decade called the I Think Initiative, which is based out of the Rotman School of Management in the University of Toronto. And what we were able to do over 10 years ago, uh, my class was the pilot project to bring in the tools of problem solving, more specifically integrative thinking, which is a problem solving tool that was created by Roger Martin, the former Dean of the Rodman School of Management, who is considered now uh, one of the top management thinkers of the world. Uh, we created a partnership to bring his tools, which he was, which we was uh, sharing with executive MBAs and the top corporate Canadians, uh, but to bring it into the classroom. And I was blessed to be part of that pilot project over 10 years ago. In my class, there are no textbooks. Um, it is all about inviting people in. It is, inv it is all about experiential learning. 
we dig down to figure out what our biases are, what are our models, how do we look at the world. Um, we learn, we teach them, we teach the students uh, endless reflection. I know that word has popped up a number of times in this conversation, the notion of authentic reflection, because if we don't know who we are, if we don't know how we are interpreting this world, how can we move forward in it? We then provide the tools of integrative thinking, system mapping, design, uh, you know, design thinking, causal modeling, and what we ultimately end up doing, which I brought into my classroom, is we actually then consult to a real-life organization for the last two months of the class. So kids are in groups and kids are coming up and consulting to real-life organizations and trying to combat <clears throat> and provide recommendations to the challenges that they're facing on any given day. We've been blessed to consult to over 20 organizations, both non-for-profit and for-profit. And this model of consulting is now being used in a challenge kit. So what's beautiful is what, what we do in my classroom is now being shared all across the province, uh, across the nation in a challenge kit. And what would end up happening <clears throat> is that teachers and classes would get this challenge for that particular organization and kids and teachers would get the tools of integrative thinking and they'd be able to invite parents, their administrators, other teachers to not only learn but also to be a part of the process of consulting. You know, the notion of understanding stakeholders and, under and being empathetic to different perspectives of education and priorities are a massive part of what integrative thinking is about. And what we've done is now create that seamless process, that experiential learning process that can still happen during COVID. Uh, in the next few weeks, teachers across the province are getting their challenge kit based on a challenge that I actually did in, with my class actually two years ago. And now we have kids from kindergarten to grade 12 all across the province that will go through that exact same process, but in their own way. This is what integrative thinking has been able to do. This is what this project has been able to do. And we are actually in a battle, you know, to create empathetic, real world problem solvers. That's what we need. We need individuals that can take on multiple perspectives instead of shutting off when they hear something that they don't agree with. We need to understand that we have to shower our kids with multiple perspectives because in today's world, and we're seeing it all over, that we only want to listen to what we also already agree with. Those are not the kids that we need in this world. Those are not the people that we need in this world. And as a result of what we're doing with these challenge kids, we are celebrating the work. We are celebrating the reflection. We are celebrating the insight of students all across you know, all across the province. Simon Tanner, he's a professor of digital cultural heritage at the Department of Digital Humanities at uh, King's College in London. And then um, we'll move to Jenny Luca, who's the head of ICT innovation uh, and learning at Camberwell uh, Grammar School in Melbourne, Australia. Um, and then we'll go back to uh, Darian Rossetier. <laughs> Um, from RMIT University. Um, so, and, and again, I'd like to open it up uh, after they, uh, after they uh, intervene to anybody who's uh, uh, in this uh, panel. Um, so the question is the following. Um, what do you think is the silver lining of this uh, COVID-19 pandemic from a skills development perspective? Um, what are the opportunities and what do you think will last in past this crisis? Uh, and how do we ensure that students prepare for this changing world that we're already starting to see and we're likely going to see post-pandemic. So let's start with, uh, with you, Simon. Go ahead. Thank you very much for asking that question. Um, and I'm going to be ridiculously optimistic here. There will be counterpoints to what I say. I'm going to try and find the most optimistic possible ways of looking at this. And there's probably two things which I think have been uh, in trend for the last few years. But I think what COVID-19 has done is has solidified them. It's made them more likely to be continuing on into the future. And one of those is relating to uh, university and university practice. And the other one is relating to digital content and access to digital content. So the first one about university. 
Uh, universities have had to go through a, an enormous sea change um, in this environment of, to understand how they're going to deliver more content in a digital manner, has had to work in both um, sort of flexible ways of uh, online classes and in-person in classes, or even times where you've got students both in an online and an in-person environment. And what COVID's done is it's kind of broken a blockade of we don't want to do this uh, and, and made us do it uh, and, and, made, and, and made us gather those skills and understanding. Um, and so we're likely to see much more distance learning opportunity being offered. Um, we're likely to see uh, much more wider uh, ranges of course content being offered in, in online environments than previously been done. But what's also going on side by side with that is uh, a greater number of universities understanding that the way that they should measure their sense of service to society is through how they're going to engage with the UN's strategic development goals um, and how they're going to measure their impact on society in relationship to those. And I think um, we're starting to see some of those sorts of uh, rethinking of the purpose of university in terms of its, its, its role. Um, and, uh, you know, so some universities, take King's College London, for instance, has particular strengths in, in, in the SDGs around health and well-being and gender equality. Um, and there'll be other universities which have, you know, great strengths in terms of Indigenous populations, Indigenous peoples. You know, so, so we're starting to see a better understanding of the way a university should sit into a global perspective uh, and, and the way that the course content that we, that we deliver should sit into that and maybe, maybe digital will allow us to reach out better. And this, this should encourage students to think that there are destinations for them when, when they, when they, as they pass through schools. The second thing I wanted to pick up on what Darian said, which was about the lifelong learners. And, you know, we, you know, learning doesn't stop at 21 or 25 or 55 or 95. It's there all the way through. And uh, the other big trend for me is about content becoming available. So this is to do with the way that uh, museums, libraries and archives have been uh, and other, other, other opportunities out there as well have been making more of their content open. So what we call the open glam uh, environment for galleries, libraries, archives and museums. Um, and to give you sort of some big headlines on those, you know, we've got the Smithsonian, which made three million digital objects freely available. But what was important was not just that they were freely available, but they were available with a CC0 license. So that these sorts of learning materials, you know, many more academic learning materials, many more cultural learning materials uh, and objects which can be used uh, to build teaching and learning opportunities are now being made more freely available. And what happened in COVID-19 was many more institutions started putting more of their content out there in a way that could be accessed um, by digital mechanisms. And the nature of that sort of zero, that sort of uh, license, the CC zero, means that that content can be available on Wikimedia, it can be available through Wikipedia, it can be mashed up, it can be shared, it can be, it can be built upon. And this is really important. We don't want cultural heritage to be something you just look back upon. You want it to be something you can actively build and make and do things with. And for students, that's really important. You know, at whatever level of learning you're at, you know, um, being able to tangibly do things with, 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 with heritage items is important. Um, and so I think those two things are, 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 are things that are, are sort of really there as, as, as sort of big opportunities in this space. There is a challenge that's still out there. We maybe haven't mentioned it as much as uh, here, which is that that what, what's often called the last mile problem. Um, and so our research we see when we're um, working with colleagues in, in, in countries like uh, Sudan or Ghana or South Africa or in Vietnam, Cambodia, is, is people have devices. Maybe they don't have as many as they could have, but they have devices. But often the, the, the real barrier is um, the cost of mobile data. So it's great that I've got all these digital images available from various institutions around the world, but if it's going to cost me data to access those, that becomes a barrier to, to, to access to those. And what you might also talk about is the last sort of the, the last five meter or last, last 10 meter problem, which is, 
you know, parents matter very much, teachers matter very much. Having all of these resources out there, having these course content out there, isn't going to isn't going to uh, necessarily resolve um, learning issues that and widen opportunity for learning if they can't be put into teaching packs or if they can't be put into a learning uh, environment which allows students to really engage with those and and understand the opportunity that's out there um, in in that data data zone. So I think there's some really good stuff out there. There's some real changes that have happened at the university level, some real changes that have happened in terms of content availability, but we've still got that sort of last mile and last 10 meters issues to, 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 to resolve around that as well. Thank you, Simon. I really love the, uh, the optimism. You lived up to it, so uh, <laughs> well done. Uh, over to you, Jenny, about uh, what you see as the silver lining here. Please go ahead. I'm hoping that I can be a little bit optimistic about it as well, um, especially considering when this is such a, a, you know, a disastrous thing for the planet in, in so many ways. But I think from a teaching perspective, um, we've definitely seen some real, real opportunities come through in terms of what the profession's capable of, um, what our teachers are capable of, uh, what our students are capable of and what our, what our families and our communities are capable of. Uh, because we've all had to combine and come together in this um, and work together to make this successful. And probably from the perspective um, from someone living in Melbourne who's, who's gone into the second lockdown um, and has taught online for, I think, probably nearly 18 weeks now, um, you know, one of the things that I think we, we saw from going from one lockdown situation, then reopening and then finding ourselves into a second lockdown was that we learned some lessons from the first one. And I think the lesson that we learned pretty strongly, and, and I've heard this from various teachers across various, um, various schools, was that uh, there was a lot of perception that it was going to be possible for um, you not, not necessarily to have to be synchronous all the time, that you could, you could run an asynchronous situation where you could, you could you know, provide students with some material to go on with and just touch base with them you know, briefly once, you know, once, once or twice a week. And I think the learning that, we, that came from that as we moved into our second lockdown, certainly the feedback that we were receiving was that our students needed to be connected to us as teachers. Our students needed us. Uh, they needed our faces. They needed our personalities. Uh, they needed our energy um, because that is what sustained them. Um, and so definitely going to this second um, lockdown that, that we faced in Melbourne, um, definitely from the perspective of the school that I taught in in many schools um, was that teachers were certainly online a lot more in the second phase of lockdown um, and talking to their students a lot more because that sense of connection was just so vital. Um, the students needed us. And I think that's one of the things, the other silver linings here has been this strong connection between school and home. We've had this incredible experience where we've been invited into students' homes and they've been invited into our homes. They've seen us in a different light. We've seen them in a different light. Um, our families, our parents are, are finally understanding the work of teachers in a much more um, granular way. And they're appreciating what it is that teachers um, bring to a classroom because they can see it in their students. Um, they, can see the, they can see students engaged, you know, in the kitchen, at the table, um, with, with a teacher in, in a classroom who's bringing every single piece of themselves to that experience. I mean, I know that my husband has, has even relayed to me um, as he's watched me teach in online, in, in online lessons that he's learned things that he, that he didn't even think he could learn um, as a result of, of listening to, to the interactions I'm having with my students. Um, and I think that that deep connection between home and family is going to be a real, a really, um, it's going to be an interesting thing as we return out of COVID um, as to what will the relationships between school and home look like and how will schools look different um, as a result of this and, and how can we how can we um, maximize this strong community um, thread that's that's happened between um, between schools and home so I think that that's a real silver lining and I think that we need to take um, we, ne we need to do something with that at, uh, you know, at the end of this um, I think there's real opportunities that are coming from this and I think that um, there's a means now to create that truly blended learning experience because we know how to do it uh, we know that the we know the technology can do it for us. We we know we can run you know running Zoom meetings and having breakout rooms and and creating that um, that that 
that experience of um, small groups in classrooms. I mean, these are all things that I think many of our teachers never believed would be possible inside um, inside a you know a computer screen, but they certainly can be can be achieved and, and very very successfully. Um, and I think a lot of our teachers have seen that, and also the, the ability for us to work in live documents with our students. Um, our, our students are using Google Docs quite um, you know very very well throughout the school, but also using um, a tool called Hapara Teacher Dashboard, where our teachers are um, using that dashboard to interact with the students' documents um, in real time, be inside the document with the child, uh, work with them, give them feedback, um, so that our kids are feeling, you know, constantly supported um, by staff. Um, and that's made a significant difference. And that, that will be, I think, an ongoing thing that many of our teachers have now learned skills that they're, they're going to take back into their regular um, teaching environment that they might not have been using before. Um, I think that the, the opportunity for us to now look for experts beyond our school and to realise that we can invite them in very easily. Um, I think everyone thought that this was just a little bit too hard. I think the realisation now that it's not too hard, that this, could, this is a very, um, you know, a Zoom link to somebody and bringing them in is a very easy thing to do. So I think that that opportunity for us to, to seek the experts, um, to, to, you know, engage some of our students who need extension, um, to provide them with that extension activity um, is in a blended learning um, environment is something that we can really look for. Um, and those opportunities just, just for those global connections, for those insights into, into in, um, communities that we, you know, that we don't always get an opportunity to interact with, you know, teach our students and show our students um, a different side of the, of, of the world um, that they may not have had an ex um, opportunity to experience. The thing that I'm frightened of, I'm frightened of that we're that because of the fact that we've we've spent so much time in online spaces that we're going to go back and and decide that we just don't want to do any of this anymore. That we want to go back to to the regular way that we did things, and it frightens me that we might lapse back. Um, so I think that leaders um, who have now seen and under, you know can see what's possible need to need to lead their schools effectively and need to actually you know, continue the conversation and. Um, continue to, to um, prompt our teachers to, to now look at the skills that they've developed and then take those skills um, and cultivate them in what will, what will hopefully return to sort of a regular school environment, but inject some of this new way of doing things into, into the course of, of how they'll do things in that environment. Um, and I think our students are going to demand that as well. I definitely think our students will start to demand a different way of doing things. I think that... Um, they can see it, they know it's possible, and I think they'll be looking for it. Thank, thank you very much, Jenny. That was really, really excellent to hear you um, make those points. I, the, one, the one point I want to second, you made a lot of interesting points. The one point I want to second is that uh, those of us in the, the development field have always uh, had uh, had a respect for uh, education and teachers and educators and uh, and the uh, uh, the infrastructure around schooling, but it has reached a level that I've never seen before. Now, now the teacher has uh, has been elevated to demigod, <laughs> demigod <laughs> type status. So, so really, it's uh, it's an amazing uh, feat. Um, Darian, over to you. Thank you. I'm just going to touch on another part of this uh, topic or this question here, and that's the bit around um, ensuring that our students are prepared for the changing global labour market. And it's bringing in the skills piece. And I think what COVID really has demonstrated for us that it's ramped up and really evidenced and shown the need for those human enterprise skills that we need for uh, employment and for our careers. But it's also shone a light on the fact that many of these skills, leadership and teamwork, critical thinking, problem solving, some of the things we're really facing now, these really complex and wicked things, are life skills. They're not just employability skills. And in this sense, they are truly transferable between jobs, between learning and, and across life contexts. So I think this is really important and it's a little bit of a silver lining as well in terms of the skills because it's really showing us that our lives are not partitioned into going to school or going to work or going to university. And, um, and many of my colleagues, and I've been hearing it um, uh, on the panel tonight, um, 
they are they're engaging in work they're teaching but they've got their children with them and all of a sudden it's now becoming a sort of a community almost like a little com uh, demonstrable community that we're showing that we've got this trend this overlap or this transition between um, the different aspects of our life and this is where I think we've got a great opportunity now to show our students that many of the skills that they have um, which haven't really been articulated in a way of a curriculum or formal learning are really important skills that they can use later but the challenge that we have um, is to be able to identify those, qualify them, and have them verified by trusted and reputable institutions so that they will be recognised um, by employers, by educational inst institutions alike, etc., etc. In other words, I'm going to touch on the word credentialing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Darian. It, it was so nice to hear the optimism from, uh, from all three uh, speakers. Uh, I think uh, we are over time right now. Uh, we had to go over because it was such an interesting panel. Uh, I enjoyed listening to all of you, learning from all of you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity uh, to do this. Uh, and uh, really, uh, this was a pleasure for me. Uh, thank you all for your time. Uh, and, uh, and I wish you well. Thank you. Bye-bye.